It's another baffling day in the world of Magic the Gathering. Wizards of the Coast has released another batch of Dustmourne House of Horror preview cards. And looking them over, they really are a confusing, muddled mess. It looks like Wizards of the Coast doesn't actually even know what they want this set to be. Magic. I am a wizard! History. I'm an old wizard! The Magic Historian. My bones hurt. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. My friends, I hope the day finds you well because we have gathered for another glimmering installment of Mega Magic News. Obviously today, we're going to be taking a look at Duskmorn cards. Wizards of the Coast has lost their mind. They are all over the place with 78 different concepts that they're trying to jam into one box. And it leads to a bunch of incoherent insanity. And if you really want a full picture of just how disparate everything is, you're going to want to check out the actual trailer for Dustmourne and the written story as well. And if you want a short form of the written story, I have that condensed for you over on my Fantasy Geographic channel. So you can watch a little series of videos that will tell you the entirety of it, and then you'll have a better grasp on just how crazy and reaching for 50 different directions that Wizards has gone with Duskmorn. That being said, let's look at some rectangles. We're starting off with a card that some people are gonna love and others are going to hate. The Lord of Pain, which is a pretty sweet name. One red, one black, and three for a 5-5 five, five legendary human assassin with menace. Your opponents can't gain life, that's always nice. Whenever a player casts their first spell each turn, choose another target player. The Lord of Pain deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to the chosen player. So clearly, this card very much wants to be played in Commander and does not want to be played in one-on-one -on -one magic. Because every time your opponent casts their first spell each turn, you're going to have to pick yourself and get smacked for its casting costs. So it's pretty much off the table if you like one-on-one -on -one magic. And some Commander players are going to hate the fact that this accelerates the progression where every turn when somebody casts a spell, somebody else is getting hit. So people who like their commander games to roll out more slowly are going to be really annoyed by this guy, where people who want the game to have some kind of more regular flow and speed up are going to be pleased to have him sitting down there on the table. And it does make it a little more interesting in terms of changing up the order you might cast spells in a turn, right? Where you're going to want to cast your biggest spell first, but you might also want to hold back later on for future turns. Maybe I don't want to cast two huge casting cost spells in the same turn so that I can smack somebody the turn after. The weirdness, the part where this feels very confused and muddled to me, is the fact that this guy is an assassin. We see the artwork, and he's shown on multiple screens here with little parts of his ball. Oh, check it out. Here's my, here's my mouth. Here's, here's another version of my mouth. Just a little bit closer up, like he's going to the dentist or something. But ultimately, how does this feel like an assassin? This feels like a warlord, like a warmonger who is ordering his slavering hordes forward, right? Like, go and destroy that guy. Also, it's pretty funky how most of them is shown on the screen and there's just this gigantic hand reaching out like how does this tie in to the whole domination of Valgavoth because it seems like Valgavoth really is the overlord demon of Duskmorn and doesn't really want to share that power around everybody has to be subservient to him in a way so where really does the Lord of Pain fit into the overall world of Duskmorn the world itself is pretty confused. Moving on, we've got Persistent Constrictor. I like this card. One black and four for a 5-3 zombie snake. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, they lose one life, and you put a minus one, minus one counter on up to one target creature they control. So it's that slow burn that harkens back to the earliest days of magic with 
cursed lands, warp artifacts, tackle maggots, where you put them out and it just slowly chews away your opponents and in the case of tackle maggot, your opponent's creatures as well. So this is a fun vibe and honestly, five mana for this as the casting cost with it being a five three makes it feel like it's not unbalanced. It doesn't feel pushed in the power category and it has persist as well which makes perfect sense when it's a persistent constrictor so when it goes to the graveyard the first time it's going to come back with a minus one minus one counter on it and if you actually have ways to remove minus one minus one counters then you can keep having it return over and over but i do like the fact that this is very much a war of attrition style card where you can put it out sit back behind your defenses and let your snake chew on everybody just a little bit just a little taste right that is fun the artwork is pretty straightforward you can literally see the constrictor here it is a zombified snake it looks like you can see the remains of who he's been chewing on down there through the hole in his body I do wonder if this was actually set to be Duskmorn artwork or if it's repurposed, but either way, it definitely fits in. Moving on, we've got Sadistic Shell Game. So this showcases the creature we saw in the first card, the Lord of Pain. And this one is also confusing to me. One black and four for a sorcery that says, starting with the next opponent in turn order, each player chooses a creature you don't control destroy the chosen creatures. So overall, it feels like a pretty funky concept in terms of, okay, I'm going to get to wipe out multiple creatures, but the opponents start picking first, right? It's like your next opponent in turn order, you get to pick a creature too. The fact that it's a creature you don't control is the only thing that makes this not complete garbage. But it's confusing to me why you would want to play a spell that costs five mana to destroy at most four creatures, but through such random scattershot as your opponents picking them, right? It's gonna be all over the place. I guess if you're somebody who really likes the deal-making aspects of Commander, then sure. It would be even funnier to me if they could pick your own creatures because then you could actually pick the Lord of Pain himself. So he's like, shame about your friends. Wanna see what's inside yours? It's a little bit weird because the Planeswalker would be the one playing the shell game with creatures inside, right? As opposed to the Lord of Pain himself. But I do have to give it to them conceptually. The idea of a giant shell game where you're put in these Iron Maiden style cups and quickly droop, 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 drooped around, that's probably just going to batter you along around the insides. Who knows what kind of spikes are going to pop out, but it is a little bit confusing to me in that there's nothing that actually really feels like a shell game because nobody is picking like, okay, pick the cup at the end, you got a one in three chance of being right. So overall, the flavor on this is muddy. And also, is he wearing, is he supposed to be an amalgamation between multiple horror guys? Cause he's got like the Freddy shirt on that totally evokes that vibe. And then he's just got a bunch of blades sticking up out of everywhere. So for me, this feels like a pretty underwhelming an unimpressive card, but for a particular type of commander player, this is probably right up their alley. Then we've got Suspended Sentence. This is actually surprisingly useful. One black and three for an instant that says, destroy target creature and opponent controls. That player loses three life. Exile Suspended Sentence with three time counters on it. And it's also got Suspend for a black and one. So you can set it up in advance on your second turn, just presuming that one of your opponents will have creatures out, which, I mean, if you put this out, like if you suspend this on the second turn, then it's going to be three turns later it goes off. So we're looking at roughly the fifth turn of the game. You can pretty much bank on your opponent having a creature at that point. So I guess the idea of the suspending thing is supposed to be he's hanging almost from like a claw game here above what looks like a pile of thorny serpents so he's just going to be fed into the snake pit this card does contribute to the confusing atmosphere of Duskmorn with all these survivors in their perfect clothing right like we were told the whole world evolved and Duskmorn basically is just a giant house of horror and that Valgavoth took over the entire world a while ago and yet we have so many people shown in 80s gear that don't they, they look brand new 
and fresh to the house, which really contradicts the overall, well, no, these are survivors who have been here for a long time. I will actually show you a survivor in this video that genuinely looks like a survivor, which in one way makes it confusing because it branches off from every other survivor, but at least it has the grizzled sort of feel. Wait till we get to him though. So overall, this feels like pretty solid creature destruction. I would put this in my cube with no real worries, right? It's kind of similar to that Tithus card, except you're not going to get to do a bunch of damage. You're going to get to do three life loss and then recur it over and over because every time you cast this, you get to suspend it. Three turns later, it happens again. So it is a little bit confusing in that it's like, it's a suspended sentence, but it keeps reiterating itself. It doesn't really tie into the flavor 100%, but who cares when it actually makes the card that much more powerful. Then we've got Barb Flare Gremlin. This is a mana barbs and a mana flare combined together into a creature, which I think is actually a really fun concept. One red and three for a three two first striker with haste. Whenever a player taps a land for mana, if Barb Flare Gremlins tapped, that player adds one mana of any type that land produced. Then that land deals one damage to that player. It does feel a little bit weird that the gremlin needs to be tapped for this. It doesn't really make sense from a flavor perspective, but from an actual power perspective, it lets you control whether he's really going to hurt you. If you don't want to get smacked down by his ability, you can cast your stuff pre-combat, then swing in with him, and then go ahead and have the ability affect your opponents, right? Because it'll be on all their turns as long as this guy's tapped. Or... If you want to take a little bit of pain for some gain, you can swing with this, and now all of a sudden you're going to get extra mana, but you will take damage. And if you don't know the cards that I'm referencing, Mana Flare is a card from the beginning of Magic that made it so that all lands tap for an additional mana, and it was huge. Tons of people used it. And Mana Barbs was a card that only the biggest jerks used that said whenever a player taps a land for mana, they take a damage. That card was incredibly obnoxious and the artwork with the little flaming whip it does kind of evoke the artwork of mana barbs a little bit because it's got that kind of barbed wire-esque vibe going on with the flames and the mana flare with the extra flames around the whip so i gotta give it a lot of credit for actually putting this all together in a way that feels like it ties to those old cards which is a great nod to somebody like me and at the same time you don't have to know anything about those cards to fully get this guy the flavor text says, you think burning the pie to a crisp was bad. You should see what it did to the chef. And that's Meg the Supply Runner. Oh, I'm glad you can keep your spirits up, Meg, in this horrible, horrific world where everything's supposed to be awful and nightmarish and all the survivors are tortured. But hey, whatever. It's all time for jokes and happiness, right? That's literally the only quibble I have about this card, though. All, ultimately, it's pretty solid. Moving on. We've got Star Athlete, like, welcome to football. We're going to run the football down the field. Two red and one for a 3-2 human warrior. He has Menace. Whenever he attacks, choose up to one target non-land permanent. Its controller may sacrifice it. If they don't, Star Athlete deals five damage to that player. And then it's got Blitz 4, so you can cast it for its Blitz cost. It comes in with haste and then pops back into your hand. So... I guess if you want to be able to use it right away and get him back into your hand to keep him safe, you can do that. This one is very strange to me when I try and figure out 100% what the flavor is supposed to be. It's like, okay, you've got the star athlete. He chooses something. That! And it's like, you got to give me that to destroy. And if you don't, I'm going to hurt you. And it's like, okay, but you have three power. So if you run up and beat on me, you're going to do three damage. How do you get to do five damage? If you're making me sacrifice, a, if like if I'm choosing not to sacrifice the permanent, right? Like where where does that make sense? Also, what is he running towards? Like what what is this? I get the idea is supposed to be like check it out. I'm the star athlete running down the field, but where where is he going? And why is he taking this zombie head? Like what what ultimately? Like yeah, he's running from gremlins. Great, he's running through. I mean, Dustborn does look horrific here, right? But what what is he running towards what's actually going on here other than they just went well you know horror you gotta have like a jock or something like this card 
is incoherent. It makes it makes no sense when you actually step back and take a look at it. Why does he do five damage? Why is he charging down the field with a zombie? Every time I show up, I gotta grab some. Oh, Dirk must grab thing and run like football guy. That's all Dirk knows. Hand out to intercept blockers? Like, you can't stop me. I'm the lead quarterback. It's just, it's confusing, honestly. I mean, from a power perspective, I, I mean, 3-2 menace, whenever it swings, you get to maybe make your opponent sack a permanent or they take five damage. I don't know. This is, it's, it's up in the air. It seems like it might be strong, but at the same time, eh, maybe not. Moving on. We got unidentified hovership. Oh, I can't even pretend like I don't hate this. Okay, so two white and one for a 2-2 artifact vehicle. It's got flying. When it enters, exile up to one target creature with toughness five or less. Even though it's empty, it's a vehicle that needs to be crewed by people, but that's okay, whatever. You know what? It shows up and it abducts somebody. So when it enters, exile up to one target creature with toughness five or less. If you're too fat, it can't pick you up with the tractor beam. And then when it leaves the battlefield, the exile card's owner manifests dread. So, okay, here you go. Your friend came back from the spaceship, but now they're a horrifying thing that actually came from your memory and it's maybe a spell that you were going to cast like uh i just overall i really hate the alien concept in duskmorn it's so shoved in here man i like of all the different random horror aspects they put in here why on earth did they include this i mean there's there's stupid statements out there going well you know we tried to make it like out of light so it's not like a ufo tech like come on man it's an un it's a ufo it's you put a ufo in the horror set and they're like look but we painted trees around it so it's inside duskmorn why is there a ufo inside of duskmorn like the other thing that we saw was at least just a manifestation of fear of being abducted by aliens which didn't make sense but at least it wasn't full on an alien this is just an alien abduction ship. There's tons of ways to abduct things with horror. It just feels so out of place in this set. It is the most confusing card that I've seen out of everything, right? Like, it's just, I get it. You want to do another Skyclave apparition style. But couldn't you just do that? Another apparition instead of a UFO? This tweaks me so hard. It's so so dumb magic's reached the point where you can go okay gandalf it's time to get in a ufo and fly to mordor <laughs> like i can't man i can't i can't even with this this is this is peak stupidity come on gandalf pretty you know what next year to be like come on gandalf grab the incredible hulk <laughs> Grab the incredible hulk oh don't forget to get a space marine because at least you'll know how to fly it oh okay anyways it's one thing when it's universes beyond right it's one thing when they go check it out we're doing a fallout we're doing this we're doing <laughs> we're doing space marines it's universes beyond this is in the magic universe now this is literally in the magic universe the same universe where where urza fought the phyrexians all of that the same universe where bolus defeated the dread leviathan now there's just ufos bro because why not because why not? Okay, anyways, I got to move on because I'm just going to keep ranting. All right, seance board. Oh, it's the Ouija. It's the Ouija board. I don't believe in the supernatural, okay? Just putting it out there. But I do, <laughs> I do have an experience with the Ouija board. When we were kids, we were playing with the Ouija board. And I know my one friend was always the one pushing the thing. You're not supposed to push the little paddle. But somebody always is pushing the paddle or nothing's going to happen, right? So my one buddy is pushing the paddle around. And then it's like, spirits, give us a sign. And all at, at that exact moment. And we freaked out. We freaked out. But it was just my dad. He could hear us through the... He was out back. He could hear us through the dog door of the house. And so he was like, ah, stupid kids. Boom, boom, boom. And for one split second, I was like, oh! But I had a Ouija board tell me that my life was going to be ended by an EOB in the year 1999. And I was just like, Can't what even is an EOB? Do you even know where you press this thing to? Anyhow, let's talk about the card. Seance board. Two mana for an artifact. It's got Morbid. 
At the beginning of each end step, if a creature died this turn, put a soul counter on it. Tap it, add X mana of anywhere one color, where X is the number of soul counters on it. Spend this mana only to cast instant sorceries, demons, and spirit spells. So, as far as Ouija boards go, this isn't the worst kind of way to kind of show it off, right? You're talking to the dead when you're using Ouija boards. So, as people's lives end, their souls get sucked into it, and then you can tap into that soul power to summon up demons and spirits, or to do ancient arcane rituals. So, overall, that works, right? And the artwork definitely has a Duskmorn feel and a Ouija board feel. There's not nearly as many letters on it, so I guess you're not going to be using it to divine things by having it point at different letters. I do like the moth representing Valgavoth inset into this. Overall, I think Valgavoth in the cards is a really imposing presence. In the written story, is a joke. There is a massive inconsistency between the two. So the idea of this seance board is actually pretty solid overall. I like the candles there where you can see it looks like some of them have been blown out with the smoke trailing up. Maybe you've just finished a ritual. And I really like the big gemstone that's inset in the little Ouija pointer. I don't know exactly what that's called. But anyways, it's time to move on to the next card. Overlord of the Bailmerk. I can't believe this is mythic. It, it genuinely confuses me as to why this is mythic. Just is it because it fits into the cycle and that's why it has to be mythic? Like, look at it. It's two black and three for a 5-5 five, five enchantment avatar horror. It's got impending just like all the other ones, but it's impending for five, right? So it's going to take five turns. For a black and one, you get to set it off with its impending. Whenever it enters or attacks, mill four cards, you may return a non-avatar creature or a planeswalker card from your graveyard to your hand. So it functions like a raise dead, right? Yeah, it mills some stuff into your graveyard to give you a target for it. But ultimately, are you kidding me? I pay two mana and then maybe I get a creature or planeswalker from my graveyard back into my hand. And then I have to wait five turns for a 5-5? Five, five? Meanwhile, if you cast it for its full cast casting cost, you're getting five mana for a 5-5. Five, five. Like, if you took this card back years ago, I'd be like, whoa, this is insane. This is out of control. But by today's standards, this is super underwhelming, right? For real. You just go, okay, this genuinely is a mythic? Is this the worst mythic in the set? I, I just, it doesn't do much for me. The artwork, on the other hand, is epic. It looks like a crazy statue that stands stock still until you start going up the side the uh, side staircases and then all of a sudden its arms start reaching out for you. Well, bam Either lightning fast or just a very slow, almost imperceptible, is it getting closer to me when I'm not looking kind of way? So it's definitely got some real nice horror vibes to it. But as a card, it sucks out loud, bro. It's confusing why they would make a mythic this garbage. Then we've got... The Waltz of Rage. Two red and three for a sorcery. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each other creature. Until end of turn, whenever a creature you control dies, exile the top card of your library. You may play it until the end of your next turn. I have no idea what this card is actually going for. Like when you look at like, I know what it's going for from a, like a mechanical perspective. It's you're going to wipe out a ton of other creatures and maybe just be left with the only creature on the board, but you'll get rewarded for any creatures you lose by getting extra gas off the top of your deck. But from like a flavor standpoint, was this originally supposed to be something that was in the whole Crimson Vow set that they repurposed? Like you've got somebody up here who's shown where their identity is down here in the reflection. It's almost like they got trapped down here, like a reflection has taken their place, right? And then you have all these other reflections around here as well that honestly look like they're just doing a, a bad job of imitating Australian Olympic breakdancers, especially this guy down here in the front, right? So the this is genuinely confusing. I'm sorry, how is this a waltz of rage 
that deals damage to all like it, it, this looks like it would make a copy of a creature and exile it or something along those lines it's like a soul prison in the floor it's very evocative artwork in one way and i can see how it would be horrific but i don't see how this is a dance of rage considering the how it should work is this one person would be wiping out everybody and these other people don't feel like they're being wiped out and then why is one of them escaped up at the top so ultimately i have no idea and the flavor text says the melody was all in her head but she'd always preferred to dance alone that doesn't help that's not good flavor text the overall concept of this card is incredibly muddy in terms of actual play value i don't know i mean you know wiping out a bunch of creatures maybe if you have a giant creature it feels at five mana like it's not going to do enough to be worth it really you know you have to be in a very particular set of circumstances to make this dance work then we've got marina vendrell one of every five one of all five colors for a legendary human warlock she's three five oh wait if she's a warlock that means she counts as an outlaw Woo! Rootin' tootin' crimes time! All right, when she enters, reveal the top seven cards of your library, put all enchantment cards from among them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, if you want, like, an enchantment lord for commander, she can fit into all the colors, right? And the more interesting part for me is the tap ability. Lock or unlock a door of target room you control. Activate only as a sorcery. Most cards only let you unlock rooms. The ability to lock a room means you can reset the rooms for their like going off triggers, which is pretty sweet, actually. I do like the fact that means you can multiply reuse a room, and especially if you have a way to untap her and get like freed from the reel, for example, where you could just keep untapping her, go ba 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 ba, and then you can just, you just stand at the door. Oh, I'm gonna lock the door. Oh, I'm gonna unlock the door. Oh, look, more demons are coming out. I'm gonna stop it. Stop locking that door. I got the key, honey. So Marina is actually an interesting character in the story. And they represented it properly here in the artwork where there's this little bubble of altered reality that encircles her. So as she travels through the house, it always shows her things in pristine condition as they were. She doesn't see the world being ruined. She doesn't know that Duskmorn has been completely converted by Valgavoth. She made a deal with the demon when it was still weak, basically saying, release me, like, like return my world to normal or I will burn the house down and you with it. And Valgavoth ultimately just went, okay, and gave into the deal. It makes no sense why now Valgavoth still is required to abide by the deal after so long of having taken over all of Duskmorn. But ultimately, like I've already said in this video, wizards really didn't do a good job of conveying the whole, well, Valgavoth conquered the plane a long time ago. It, half of the stuff they're doing feels like, well, Valgavoth maybe hasn't even actually taken over the plane and has only taken over a small part or the house is is all that it is and people are going into the house so this set really does suffer from some ma major flavor issues but the marina artwork is fantastic it's showing the the bubble of reality that follows her making sure all the plants like look here you can see this bouquet of flowers on one side of it it's in full bloom on the other side it's rotted and wilted right so that is very evocative flavor and it's an interesting design to go with the whole room concept. Moving on, we've got Rip Spawn Hunter. Okay, this dude is what I'm talking about when I said we were gonna get a grizzled survivor. If you actually take a look up on the face, he's got a bunch of scars cutting into him, whatever. He's just a big, beefy, grizzled dude who has survived everything. Raw with this admittedly crazy tech that that part is, it's a, it's a little bit confusing. How do you have these giant functional weaponry inside of like Duskmorn when all the survivors, like in the story, they tell us they're making their gear out of little bits of toasters and stuff. Not like, they don't have foundries where they can melt things down and actually form them in the, into what they want. So this is what ties into that confusing 
how are these people wielding this technology do you, like it, it really does feel like they had the plan where it's like we're gonna have a bunch of ghostbusters go into this haunted house and then at the last minute they're like we got to go with another flavor concept and so just like with the trailer they mashed multiple things together and it ends up incoherent but rip the beef boy not too bad one white one green and two for a four four legendary human survivor i think this is the only legendary survivor so at the beginning of your second main phase if rip is tapped reveal the top x cards of your library where x is its power put any number of creatures and or vehicle cards with different powers from among them into your hand put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order so that feels like yo i showed up just in time to save you Bwah! because it's based on the power of rip he comes in and goes the more strong i am the better equipped i am the more people i can save salvaging vehicles salvaging people essentially we're gonna save you that has the absolute right vibe for like this house of horror i'm coming in and i'm taking you with me right and the whole like spawn hunter concept where it's like no no I'm a survivor, but the kind of survivor that goes out and seeks confrontation to save others. So that is some epic flavor. Rip is a beefy dude indeed. Moving on, we've got dissection tools. This is a strange one. Five mana for artifact equipment. When it enters, you manifest a dread and then attach dissection tool to that creature. So the equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, and has death touch and lifelink right so five mana basically nets you a four four that has death touch and lifelink in colorless that's not too shabby overall it is confusing with its equip ability obviously the sack of creature is to try and give it some kind of power balance overall but it really doesn't make sense from a flavor perspective like these are tools that you pick up and use right so if you like I can pick up and use a pair of weird praying mantis scissors. I can pick up an injector. I can pick up those hooks. You don't have to sacrifice a creature to be able to get those. They could just be handed around. It's really, really confusing, the flavor concept of, hey, you want to take these scissors? Sure do. Well, you got to go pull Billy's head off then. Wait, what? Yeah, you just can't pick up. Sorry, man, you can't pick up that pair of scissors unless you punch Martha to death. Like, what? How does that work? So ultimately, eh, I mean, yeah, you get a four, four for five, life link of death touch. But after that, sacking creatures, I mean, I guess it's great if you want to actively be sacking creatures. You have other things that care about that and get benefits from it. But it is, it is a confusing card when you really stop and think about it and go, wait, what? Anyhow, that's the last card we have to talk about today. Thanks for coming and hanging out, my friends. Let me know if you made it all the way to the end of the video. Let me know by going, I ain't no tool in the comments. That'll confuse people who have not made it all the way through the video and are reading through. They're like, did he start calling people tools? Why are people insisting they're not a tool? Yell it in all caps. I am no tool. <laughs> because it makes me laugh. All right, so I'll be doing a live stream over on my live stream channel. You can see what it looks like right here. If you want to come over and hang out, that's where I'll be. A big shout out to my patrons for supporting my channel. You guys rule. And I will see you all, my friends, in the next video.